Hi, and welcome to Zion Lutheran Church. I am Pastor Randall Neal, and we're so happy to have you with us on this June 7th of 2020. This is Trinity Sunday, the day that the Christian Church recognizes, acknowledges, and focuses on our triune God, one God and three persons. So this morning I'd invite you to be listening as the three Bible lessons are read and the songs that are sung, the hymns that are played. All of these have this same theme of how God has presented himself, how he works in our lives, and how important it is that you and I respond and as we are blessed by him. So thank you for being here this day. Several things I want to share with you. First, look at my head. Tuesday was one of the happiest days I've had in two months. I got a haircut. That was a big deal trying to get in, but I feel so much better. It seemed the various people when they came out of the, the shop, they all did a little two-step dance. They too were happy. So that kind of felt good, and I'm, I'm hoping you've had some good experiences as we gradually reopen. And speaking of which, we are getting closer and closer and closer to the time that we can come together as God's people here at Zion. And we're looking forward to it, and you are a big part of that. We have not only a plan for how we're going to do things once the doors are open, but we also need some helpers, a restart plan, and we have information on our weekly newsletter. So please take a look on our website, click on the newsletter, and it's going to talk about uh, the pieces that we need in actually three committees. Uh, there'll be a summary sheet of what we're doing, but we need three different groups. We need a welcome group, two to three people, uh, to work each service, uh, and that is to be welcoming people at the door, keep helping people maintain the six-foot social distancing, uh, the masks that we'll be needing to wear. Secondly, we need a, what we're calling a host team, and here we're talking three to five folks, and that'll be at our services, uh, at the services that we do have, and that's going to be managing the flow of people coming through the entrance to help maintain uh, activities inside the building. So we need that. And then the third one is the cleaning team. Because we are very conscious of the virus that's among us and around us. And so after each service, and at this point, we're planning on a Saturday at 5 o'clock and a Sunday at 8.30. That's what we're starting with. Long term, of course, uh, the plan is to go back to 3. But to start with, we're going to go Saturday 5 and Sunday at 8.30. And after each of those services, we need to wipe the place down and make sure things are clean so that we're ready. And we're looking for 4 to 5 people, 4 to 5 people to uh, maintain or work on the, the cleaning team. So if any of these are areas that you're interested in, there's going to be a link on our website that you can click. I think it's called Sign Up Genius, Genius, something like that. But it's not there yet, but it will be soon. So be thinking about how you best can help us out there. So we look forward to that. Uh, we still need a few more face masks. Uh, if you are able to uh, provide them, make either cloth face masks. We need your help. If you need a pattern, patterns are available. There's a collection basket in the uh, finished masks in the church lobby. Also, Zeke hiring. We need our a new office administrator assistants. Take note of that. And finally, just kind of a, a proud moment for us as a congregation. And that is uh, Kevin Kester, son of the congregation, now serving in his first year as a pastor out in South Dakota. And he was recently highlighted in a seminary uh, magazine journal and just a marvelous article with pictures and that also is located uh, on the website and you can get that information through zionhopkins.org. So a wonderful day. Thank you for being here. We look forward to an exciting worship experience on this Trinity Sunday. Let's open in a word of prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, we ask you to be with us this day, this day that, uh, as Pastor Neil said, the focus is on you. Can't really understand with human logic how three persons, one God. But Heavenly Father, we ask you to restore in us the faith and hope and belief and trust in you that what you have laid out in the Bible, your plans for us, how we interact with you, how we experience you, all of those things we ask you to be with us during these days and these weeks ahead where things will be shifting yet again here in the life of Zion Lutheran Church. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. 
make our beginning in the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen. I'm going to open with one of our favorites in Christ alone. As Pastor Neil said, our readings today, along with the other portions of our liturgy during this service, are all focused on this idea of our Trinitarian God. So we go back to the beginning of the Bible, the book of Genesis for our Old Testament lesson. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, to chapter 2, verse 4a. Quite a lengthy reading, so hopefully you've got a, a comfortable spot on the sofa or chair you're sitting on. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void. The darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day and called the darkness night. And there was evening and there was morning the first day. And God said, Let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters, and let it separate the waters from the waters. And God made the expanse and separated the waters that were under the expanse from the waters that were above the expanse. And so it was. And God called the expanse heaven, and there was evening and there was morning the second day. And God said, Let the waters under the heavens be gathered together in one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. 
God called the dry land earth, and the waters that were gathered together he called seas. And God saw that it was good. And God said, let the earth sprout vegetation, plants yielding seed, and fruits bearing fruit, and which is their seed, each according to its kind on the earth. And it was so. The earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed according to their own kinds, and trees bearing fruit, and which is their seed, each according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning the third day. And God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years, and let them be lights in the expanse of the heavens to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made the two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night and the stars. And God set them in the expanse of the heavens to give a light on the earth, to rule over the day and over the night, and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good, and there was evening and there was morning, the fourth day. And God said, let the waters swarm with swarms of living creatures, and let birds fly above the earth across the expanse of the heavens. So God created the great sea creatures and every living creature that moves with which the waters swarm according to their kinds and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. And God blessed them saying, be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters and the seas and let birds multiply on the earth. And there was evening and there was morning, the fifth day. And God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures according to their kinds, livestock and creeping things and beasts of the earth according to their kinds. And it was so. And God made the beasts of the earth according to their kinds, and the livestock according to their kinds, and everything that creeps on the ground according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. And subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of all the earth, and every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food, and to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the heavens, and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day God finished his work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. These are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created. Move now to our epistle reading coming again from the book of Acts. We're going to focus a lot on the book of Acts during this season of Pentecost. And we'll talk more about that later. And also next week my sermon will focus on that fact. So Acts chapter 2, 14a and 22 to 36. Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know. This Jesus, delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up loosing the pangs of death, because it is not possible for him to be held by it. For David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced. My flesh also will dwell in hope. For you will not abandon my soul to Hades or let your Holy One see corruption. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will make known to me and make me full of gladness with your presence. 
brothers. I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Being therefore a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with him an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on the throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses." being therefore exalted at the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit that has poured out onto you, you yourselves are seeing and hearing. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. In our Holy Gospel, coming from St. Matthew, chapter 28, verses 16 through 20. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which God had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always, even to the very end of the age. Here is our gospel. Continue at this time with our next song, another favorite, at least of mine, by faith.
Thank you, Lori and Bryce, for sharing that message of encouragement for us by faith. Our text for the day is the gospel lesson that was shared moments ago about Jesus' command and the initial motion or the initial idea of the Trinity. Uh, you know, we sure live in a different world from when I was a kid. Shoot, we live in a different world from what it was two or three months ago, correct? Our COVID-19 world has, has changed how we view a lot of things around us. Now, some of the changes have been horrible, but some of the changes actually have been pretty good. For me, I like the fact that increased family time has taken place. There's been a shift of role models, and I like that. A shift away from the high-profile celebrities. A shift away from the very expensive sports figures. A shift away from financial wizards who aren't really so wizardly anymore, correct? And we're switching back, I think, as I look around, to role models who have been demonstrating compassion and patience and generosity and love. I think those are good changes, and I hope those don't go away once life gets back to whatever our new normal is going to be. Now, as those things and priorities in COVID-19 world, which used to dominate our thoughts and our choices and behaviors, have melted into a lesser role, I'm wondering, actually I'm hoping, that more folks are beginning to think about and reflect on areas of life that are actually much more timeless, much more eternal than those things that come and go. I think the most significant shift in thinking, at least I hope, is a refocus, is a return to what we as Christians call God. I know some of you smile about that, but God? You see, with the rise in our country of living standards and having greater financial f flexibility in recent years and easier travel, even though we're limited right now, but it'll return, more ready access to health care and education, this whole concept of and need for God seems to have diminished. When everything is going so well, folks have come to think that they don't need a God to function in life or, or give thanks. Or they can do it themselves. Through their own abilities, through their own efforts, my education and my, my work ethic. Make your own luck, so to speak. So I think during this COVID-19 time, the return to a mindset of timeless and eternal concept is good overall. However, this entire concept of God has become a bit more fluid than it has been since the founding of our country back in the 1700s. When Americans used to term, used the term and concept of God back then and for the last number of hundreds of years, they were identifying what Christians call the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. One God, three persons. But in more recent years, more and more folks have redefined God in their own minds based on him solely on their personal feelings and opinions. I think you know what I'm talking about. For some folks, God is merely the name used to personify nature, you know, Mother Nature. And for others, God is simply the, the inner force within us. May the force be with you. And still others have latched on to world religion gods like Buddha and Allah, stating these are merely other names for the same God. Kind of challenging, isn't it? Not what we were used to in times past. What do you think? Well, this concept of the Trinity, no question about it, can be confusing. I mean, how can you have only one God and yet have three persons? <laughs> I don't get it. But you know what? It's okay that you and I don't fully understand the Trinity. I mean, think about it. Why shouldn't there be mysteries too grand for our little brains to comprehend? I mean, what fish can ever adequately explain the nature of the keeper of the aquarium in which he lives? 
I mean, how can we, who are limited by space and time, ever hope to explain one who doesn't even fit the categories of space and time? <laughs> kind of reminds me of a time when one of my seven grandchildren was, was trying to figure out the new computer their family had just got. This wasn't all that long ago. Well, the little guy was sat, he sat there staring at the screen there in their living room, unsure how to get this computer thing going. Just a little guy. Well, one of his older cousins happened to be there at the time and wanted to help, of course. She's a helper by nature. And this cousin looked at the screen and then looked at her young cousin. And her, her most reassuring voice said to him, the computer wants to know your name. And then she steps back, and she watched. And the little boy kind of leaned towards the monitor, the screen, and whispered, My name is Lucas. <laughs> well, some of us may approach the Trinity with that same sense of mystery. Now, most of the world's people believe in a creator God of some kind. I mean, this belief is certainly not unique to us as Christians. I mean, the majesty of the mountains and the trees and the skies, they kindle within folks and cultures a feeling of thankfulness and awe for such beauty, such, such grandeur. And that's good. But whom shall we say thanks to? I think instinctively we know the answer to that question. We give thanks to God the creator and sustainer of our world, the, the God that was identified in Genesis 1 that Pastor Dan read for us just moments ago. But you know, such a God can be frightening to us. We know he has the power to create these magnificent worlds and universes, which also means he has the power to crush us like a bug if he so chooses. Will he? We become intimidated sometimes and apprehensive at the thought that Almighty God might be mad at me and decide at any moment to snap his fingers and vaporize me. It can be intimidating. But just about the time we feel there's no hope for us with this ominous God, he does something so extraordinary that it boggles our mind. God becomes one of us. Incredible. In a manger, in a stable, in Bethlehem of Judea 2,000 years ago, a baby was born. You see, when we couldn't reach up to God, God reached down to us in the life of Jesus of Nazareth, whom we call Christ, the Messiah, the Savior. You know, we never really knew for sure how God felt about us as human beings until we saw Jesus entering the world as a baby, just like you and me. There's, there's a wonderful story about Nelson Rockefeller. Hopefully, many of you know him. He's a former three-time governor of New York State back in the 1960s and 1970s. He was also vice president of the United States from 1974 through 1977 under Gerald Ford. Now, although he was extremely wealthy, the Rockefellers, Rocky, as he liked to be called, he loved to tell folks that he went to public school in New York City up near Harlem, instead of with a big smile on his face. And he told how he used to roller skate to school with his friends. <laughs> of course, what he rarely mentioned was that there was a limousine following behind with bodyguards. And when he and his buddies got tired, they got in the limo. <laughs> oh, my. How different was Jesus? How different was his experience? There was no limo, not even a guardian angel. He experienced the full range of what it meant to be human, to experience heartbreak and rejection and despair. And through it all, his love for humanity never failed. What Jesus did was taught us God is love. More than that, Jesus showed us in his suffering and death how far God's love will go. 
God so loved the world, what did he do? He gave his only son. Jesus assumed the weight of our sins on himself. And then he willingly died a horrible death on that cross to satisfy the demand of punishment for sin. God, the creator of the universe, is a loving person who has entered our universe to restore us to himself. And thirdly, God is the dynamic divine presence in our lives today. You see, Jesus promised he would not leave us alone or helpless when he ascended to heaven. He'd send a counselor, he said, a helper, a friend. And he did that in the person of the Holy Spirit. So there we've got it. God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The Holy Trinity. One God, three persons. Now, having elaborated a bit on the uniqueness of the Trinity, I need to suggest one more thought. And that is this. There is a fourth person of the Trinity. <gasps> is Pastor Neil being heretical? <laughs> well, I better explain then, right? That fourth person is essential to God's plan for his world. There's a pastor named Ron uh, Del Bente. And he talks about his early days in his ministry when he was responsible for the Sunday school program of his church. And so each Sunday morning, uh, well, the services were after the services and in between the services, he would stop in each of the classrooms to, to read the Bible lesson for the day and talk with the various children, various age groups. And sometimes he'd tell the children a story about the, from the Bible, and he'd only stay five or ten minutes in each class, and then he'd leave for the next classroom. And then the teacher would continue with the lesson. It seemed like the children really enjoyed the time he spent with them each week. In fact, they'd, they'd be on their lookout for him. Apparently, one particular Sunday, as he walked past one of the windows in the preschool room, a little boy cried out, Hey, get ready! Here comes Jesus! Well, at the time, Ron smiled. And he found the remark kind of amusing. But the more he thought about it, he said there was something unsettling about it as well. Now, at the time, Ron had a full beard, and, and because it was right the, near the church time, he was wearing a white robe. And he said, I probably did look like the pictures of Jesus the children had seen. As he thought about it, he felt more and more uncomfortable about being mistaken for Jesus. Not much later, he met with a colleague and Ron shared the experience. And his friend asked him, well, what was your routine with the children each Sunday? And Ron said, well, I, I give each of them a hug. And usually two or three of them would climb up in my lap while I'm telling the story to their group. A colleague immediately thought of Jesus blessing the little children on his lap. And the friend said, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if some of these kids look back one day and wonder if they really did meet Jesus in those special moments. From that moment on, Ron would ask himself, what am I doing each day to be more like Jesus? Well, have you figured out by now who that fourth person in the Trinity is that I'm speaking of? Again, I don't want to sound heretical, but that fourth person of the Trinity is you, you, my friend. You see, many folks will never experience Christ until they experience him in you. I'm guessing you've heard the expression, Christianity is more caught than taught. Well, it's true. As far as I'm concerned, it's true. Christianity more caught than taught. You see, my friends, you are the representative of what Christianity is all about. To folks around you, especially if they don't know Jesus, you're the embodiment of Jesus. Jesus becomes real to the person around you. In fact, for many folks, the only Bible they will ever read is you. You are the church on legs. Big job? Intimidating job? Yeah. But what fun! What marvelous 
fun that can be. You get to share God's love with people. Oh, what a blessing we have. I'm guessing that many of you have heard about the father and son team of Rick and Dick Hoyt. Rick was born in 1962. and He was paralyzed from the neck down and with severe cerebral palsy. Doctors tried to, to get Rick's parents, Dick and Judy Hoyt, to put their baby in an institution. And they gave him no hope for a normal life. But the Hoyts believed that their son deserved every possible chance for improvement. So they took him home and raised him as normally as they could. Well, the cerebral palsy part left Rick unable to speak. So Dick and Judy raised $5,000, which was a lot back then, to give to Tufts University for its work in, the communica in a communication device for severely impaired. And the engineers at Tufts were successful in creating the first ever interactive communicator. In fact, my middle daughter, Jessica, has used one and currently has one of these. Not the identical one, but one like it where she's able to interact with this device even though she has no voice of her own. Well, that was true of Rick as well. He was able to type out messages to his family. And you know what they discovered? That their son was an intelligent and witty young man. Now, when Rick was 16, one of his schoolmates was badly hurt in an accident. And a benefit race was set up to help the young man's family pay for his medical bills. Rick wanted badly to participate in the five-mile race, so he convinced his father to run in the race and push Rick along in his wheelchair. His dad, Dick, was, was an active kind of guy anyway, so he said, sure, I'll try it. Well, Dick, reporting afterwards, said the race left me feeling like I'd been run over by a truck. But... He also said it was exhilarating to see his son Rick so hyped. And Rick typed this message for his father a few days after the race. He typed, Dad, when I'm running, it feels like I'm not handicapped anymore. Oh, well, that's all it took for Dad, for Dick Hoy, to resolve that he and Rick, his son, would enter more races in the future. Now, I'm guessing that many of you have seen since that time Dick Hoyt running hundreds of races while pushing his son Rick in his wheelchair. Think of all Rick Hoyt and the rest of the Hoyt family would have missed out if Rick's parents had believed the doctors when they said there was no hope for their child. Think of all the fun Rick would have missed if he didn't have a father willing to give of himself to help Rick surmount his human limitations. How does God normally operate in our world, my friends? Isn't it usually through ordinary means? Doesn't he normally operate through people? Ordinary people like Dick Hoyt. In fact, God uses parents to impact his children. He uses classmates in school to show compassion and care. He uses colleagues at work to demonstrate honesty and faithfulness. I can't explain how exactly the Holy Spirit does it, but God works in us and through us. And our unique gifts to touch the lives of people around us. Touch them with God's love and care. Just like Dick and his son Rick have for thousands of people around them. So, as we leave this day, think about who that fourth person of the Trinity is. You are. And may God bless you. In Jesus' name we ask these things. Amen. Now we come to the time in our service where we are to relay to those folks around us, relay to other people in the world that know us exactly what we call God, exactly who we trust in, and exactly where our faith lies. We continue by confessing our belief in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. And in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. 
he descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We always take this time now where we'd normally be passing the offering plates and give you another opportunity to, uh, to hear about the things that are going on at Zion, the wonderful things that still go on. We remain fully staffed. We remain open in a limited fashion, continuing the business of the church. So we ask you to continue to do what you're doing, praying for us, encouraging us, continue to sending in your tithes, whether it be online or whether it be in person uh, at the downstairs entrance. Got a lot of things still going on and a lot of things that we need to get through. Pastor Neil mentioned we're looking for some volunteers that will be willing to help us as we plan to reopen those groups that will need to be in place so that we can do so safely and according to mandates from our governors. So as we look forward to that time of reopening Zion for public worship, we again ask you, remain faithful in all those things that you do for Christ's church. Several of you have expressed over the past weeks a desire to help our local community in specific to heal after the events of the past few weeks. The protests, the riots, the focus on our downtown Minneapolis and St. Paul area. There are plenty of chances for you to continue to be involved, whether that be simply donating some money or purchasing supplies or volunteering down in those hurting neighborhoods. And if you want more information about how you can specifically help in those ways, please connect with me, email or phone. Let me know what you would be willing to do, and we'll get a team together and figure out exactly how Zion will respond to Christ as, as Christ's church in this uh, calamity, not only in the midst of the pandemic, but also now in this time of crisis and healing so needed for our country, our nation, and our community. Let's move to the prayers of the church. Father God, we ask you to help us to be faithful to the work that you want us to be doing for Christ's church. Give us insight during these challenging times of a health pandemic, civil unrest, protests against racial injustice, and the real everyday concerns that are personal to each one of us. Help us to discern between fact and rhetoric, between reality and personal interpretation. Allow us to lean on you and look to you for answers that are appropriate and reasonable for your children to be looking towards. We ask you to be with the family of those who are grieving and feeling the after effects of the killing of George Floyd, his family and those in that community especially. We ask you to be with all the communities who suffer in the midst of destruction, and destruction of loss, of lives, of property. We ask you to be with folks who are distrustful and fearful in their everyday life. We ask you to bring us faithful leaders to lead, faithful volunteers to help where needed. And we ask that people in our sinful world would look to you ultimately and find your face amidst all the negative that can weigh us down. Thinking back to Pastor Neil's sermon, what was our focus today? Our focus was on God the Father sending his son to us to do what? So that he could help us, so that we could now live that life of faith every day with him looking to him, leaning on him with the help of the Holy Spirit working inside believers in Jesus. So, Heavenly Father, we ask you to continue that work in each one of us, your children. We give you thanks for the wonderful things that are happening these days, the milestones of life, anniversaries and birthdays, especially we think this week for the 93rd birthday of June Lundgren. Thank you for giving her all of those years of life, the vast majority of them here in our midst at Zion. Heavenly Father, we ask you to be with all those celebrating. And Father, at the other end of the spectrum, there are many who are finding some challenging times, whether it be in their health or whether it be in the emotions or relationships or finances. Everyone has issues right now. And we ask you to be with those who we name now out loud and in our hearts. So we ask you to be with Chris Regario, Jim Wagner, Anita Olson, Tamaya Hassing, Rob Wilson, Kathy Coble, Catherine Jensen, Randall Stack, Orville McIntoon, Diana Smith, Lisa Paulson, Rick Shorten, Nicole Genedek, 
John Liu, Marla Bender, Andy Nelson, Isabel Kloss, Karen Doyweiler, Beth Scanlon, Phyllis Olson in the hospital now, Teresa Sundstrom, Cindy Stover, Linda Johnson, Marion Groh, Krista Buda, Pastor Bill Kermsey, Chris Hankey Burns, sister of Ann Hankey, for Jean and Sylvia Herzon in a really bad car accident, ask for their healing and continued protection for them, and for Jessica Neal. Heavenly Father, we know that you love each one of these as your chosen people, as your children. We ask you to be with these people especially and all those others who you are aware of who we may not be aware of. We ask all these things in your name. We also ask you to continue to be with Zion, with our finances, with the ministries that we are doing in more of a limited capacity that, that sometime very soon we will be able to open up and do more of the ministries, more of those people dynamic things that we are so used to doing. Heavenly Father, be with those who have suffered loss. In the past week, a couple of friends of the families of Kyle and Teresa Johnson, the family of Paula Lindbergh, Paula finally succumbing to cancer. The family of Jay Peril, 53-year-old, seemed to be healthy, heart attack. Heavenly Father, those families, one of them knowing that probably the time was coming, but the other just out of the blue. Heavenly Father, life is so special, and life happens so quickly sometimes. Be the peace over these families that they can count on you and give them comfort in these days ahead. Finally, Heavenly Father, we pray for five special families here at Zion. We pray for Sylvia Wiebe, for Bonnie Wildberg, Evelyn Wildermuth, Bruce, Lindy, Heather, Holly, and Robert Wilson, for Deb and Naomi Wold. Each of these people special to us, and each of them special to you. They have their own talents and gifts and abilities, and as Pastor Neil said, who we should be looking for, who, what, would she, we should, what should we be doing? looking to the Father, looking to the Son, working in the Holy Spirit inside of us for those things that we ought to be doing, each one of us with our own specific skill sets and gifts. So we ask that you continue to be with us. We ask that you be with all those who need you in their lives and that more people will daily come to you in their own lives and in their own experience. We ask all these things in the name of Jesus, the same Jesus who taught us to pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Continue now with our hymn, Holy, Holy, Holy. Thank mm -hmm. you.
now as we go our separate ways. May the Lord indeed bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and grant you his eternal peace. Amen.